Live from New York at the Chainalysis Lynx Conference, this is Public Key. And I'm your host, Ian Andrews. This is the fifth and last episode of the Live from Lynx series. This special five-part series covered everything from cybersecurity to regulations to tokenization and sustainability. And it was brought to you by our good friends at Deloitte, the official sponsor of Live from Lynx. As Bitcoin started gaining popularity during the last bull run, many of the critics were quick to point out the issue of energy consumption during the proof-of-work mining process. In this episode, I'm joined by Jane Kordakovsky, who is general counsel at the Cello Foundation. She'll be educating us on what a carbon negative and mobile first blockchain ecosystem really looks like and explain why this could be the solution to the growing dilemma of the underbanked and unbanked in both the United States and around the world. Jane touches on her time at the Department of Justice and how the transparency of the blockchain is an attractive feature for identifying illicit activity and also tokenization of real world assets. Now, by the time you listen to this episode, we'll have just wrapped up Lynx EMEA in Amsterdam. It was an amazing two days of content Content from regulators, policymakers, law enforcement, and digital asset businesses. The European optimism for the future of digital assets was clear, and it seems like the regulatory clarity provided by Mika is meaningfully positive for all involved. The best content from the event will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. So go to the link in the show notes right now and subscribe so you don't miss out on a thing. We are back. At Lynx live, I'm joined by Jane Kartikowski. Very good. That was great. You did a great job. I'm very impressed. Thank you so much <laughs> for joining time. us, Jane. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, glad to be here. You're with CELO. Yes, Foundation. The Foundation. Yep. Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot about CELO, but I'm guessing there's some people listening who are like, CELO Green? The- yeah, the, <laughs> the artist, not the artist. The mobile first blockchain. Yeah. So I am the general counsel at the foundation. Yep. And the foundation is a grant giving organization that supports the cell ecosystem. Yeah. And I know we'll talk more about it, but basically the blockchain was started with a goal of achieving financial inclusion and sustainability. It actually launched on Earth Day, which is coming up, which is exciting. Um, and that was done very thoughtfully by sort of the core contributors because the idea was to have a mobile first blockchain that was carbon negative and what perfect day to do that right to launch is on earth day and since then a lot of the grants that the foundation gives and supports projects are focused on climate and bringing real world use cases and real world assets on chain and doing adoption in a very thoughtful and mission oriented uh, way which is really why I joined the foundation from my background of mission-oriented work uh, on the government side. So yeah, so happy to be here and talk about it. I love all these things. The climate negative statement on the website, this Mm -hmm. is one of the first things that stood out to me when I was doing some research for the podcast, because there's a lot of organizations out there that have these, I think, good and certainly well-intended climate neutral or carbon neutral goals usually they have a date far out in the distant future 2030 2040 yeah. 2050. but the organization is very upfront about carbon negative so how do you go about doing that because i think crypto blockchains in general have this reputation of unnecessary power consumption as sure. part of the core technical design can you talk a little bit about how you get to to the carbon negative, negative? sure yeah i mean i think one of the first things i always talk about is educating about what different types of digital assets there are, different types of protocols, what the technology does. And so at its core, right, when people think about crypto, and I put that in quotes, it's a very broad term as they think sometimes Bitcoin, right? And Bitcoin is mined and it takes a lot of energy to mine that Bitcoin. There's been a lot of I'm sure conversations about proof of work, right, versus proof of stake. And so Celo, the blockchain, is a proof of stake protocol. The proof of stake is different, right, fundamentally from the technology side than proof of work. And so Ethereum moved, right, had the merge. There was a lot of discussion, you know, people on your podcast talking yep. about it, I'm sure. And so the idea, and I think what is different about Celo, the protocol, but also the projects that are building on it, is that fundamentally it's proof of stake and the thought around was how do we take the cello that's staked right on the protocol and turn it into something that is positive 
for the climate, so has positive externalities? How do we motivate and provide support to projects that are doing the same thing, whether it's through carbon offsets or preservation of forests in a small community in Chile? And those are hard things to do, and they don't happen overnight, but they're also things that you have to build an infrastructure that is secure and you have to build trust for people to want to support it and to build on it, right? And I think that's generally one of the biggest things that the industry is sort of wants and to foster is more engagement around not just talking about innovation, but putting actual work into how do you make that infrastructure secure enough for people to feel like they should be working and building yeah. for positive externalities, right, in, in this space, but also for the communities. And I think the other big focus is not just narrowly. We live in a global world. A decentralized protocol like Celo is accessible to anyone in the world that wants to build on it, which is a really important thing because you're talking about communities in the Philippines. You're talking about communities in sub-Saharan Africa. You're talking about communities in the U.S. And, um, and I think that there's a lot of great use cases that can be built around that with the focus, right, yeah. of what is that positive externality? How yeah. do we preserve the climate? How do we preserve rainforest? How do you preserve water, right? I was just in Arizona a few weeks ago. There are communities within Arizona that do not have running water, right? So they're building and they have to bring water in. How do we use blockchain? How do we use this technology to solve for those issues? And I think that's really interesting. I mean, I think this is why I'm really excited to be in this space because there are real world problems that can be solved with this technology and we just have to lean in to identifying those problems and then identifying solutions for them. Yeah, you know, our CEO, Michael Groninger, at his opening keynote this morning mm -hmm. brought up this real world assets, real things, not just yep. cryptocurrency or an NFT. Just wanted to jump in and share a moment from Michael Groninger's opening remarks at Lynx NYC, where he talks about the adoption journey of cryptocurrency being very similar, perhaps even faster than the adoption of the internet. Let's listen. I think one of the interesting parallels is when we looked at music and the internet. A lot of information moved on the internet in the early days, and some information was like the easy information to put there. But then there was information like music that actually had copyright rules around it, and a lot of like red tape around how you could move it, how you could sell it, how you could do other things. And it actually took almost a generation from Napster to Spotify to put music on the internet. If any of you think that it's slow in crypto, it's not. It's actually moving really fast, because the things we are trying to put on the blockchain of value are far more complicated and have far more red regulatory frameworks built around them and more regulatory hurdles. And those are the ones we're in the middle of solving. The way we are solving it is like on the public blockchain side, we see the native cryptocurrencies. That's a no-brainer. They were there uh, inherently and easy to put there. DeFi created new ways of doing transactions between different currencies and tokens. We've seen digital art already in the digital space and possible to live there. We've seen uh, stable coins as being probably the thing of public blockchains that's first furthest to the private side, furthest regulated, but still able to exist on a public ledger. Now that Michael's given us a great foundation, let's shift back to Jane discussing how real world asset tokenization could enable preservation of our environment. It sounds like you've been thinking about this a lot at the foundation. You just touched on water as being you know, a very real thing to a lot of people, right? right. Source of life. When you say real world assets coming on chain, mm -hmm. it's actually like a water credit or unpack so there's, that for Yeah, a so that's a great question. There's a lot of different projects, right? Yeah. I just think about water, like what farmers need. How yeah. do you build sustainability with smaller farmers, right? Yeah. How do you preserve parts of land in communities where the green, right, the grass, the forest is really important? And how do we tokenize that, right? Can you tokenize that and ensure that there is buy-in from the community to preserve 
that land or preserve that forest or preserve like ways for water to be distributed within communities. And one of the things also that drew me to the foundation was that there was a lot of research done on the ground in communities about, you know, why mobile first? How do people use money? How do they feel safe using it? The idea with a mobile device is most people in the world have one. They're not necessarily sophisticated, you know, Apple 15 or whatever the latest is, but it's much easier to remember a public key that is your phone number or that you know is your mother's, your sister's, your friend's number and send them instantaneously to your phone something than what you touched on with, which is what a lot of attention is around is the speculative aspect of quote, crypto yeah. and how do we shift the conversation to when people talk about mass adoption and when will this wave of innovation touch ordinary people? And I think the way to do that is when you are solving ordinary people's problems and kind of just taking a step back. Part of that, when I was at the Justice Department, I worked on a lot of cases involving forced labor, human trafficking, money laundering in that space. But what is really interesting is that blockchain technology, right, allows transparency in a way that if a company says they don't have forced labor in their supply chain, if you're using an open, transparent, immutable blockchain and that technology, it's much easier to trace for that and identify that in a way that our current infrastructure of technology makes it much harder because there's a lot of layers, right? If you're a CEO sitting in the U.S., and there's someone picking cotton in another country versus, as I said, a decentralized open platform that is available and you can see every transaction as it's happening. I think that's pretty powerful. And that goes back to bringing real world assets on chain. There's a lot of conversations about how do you do that to ensure that you're not double counting, right? That if it's carbon offsets, that you have something that is visible. And if it's happening in real time and if someone changes it improperly, that will also be visible. It's visible to you, Ian, just like it's visible to me. And it doesn't matter where we are in the world. I think those are things that, again, build that trust and accountability that you have to build when you're trying to educate communities that may not know anything about blockchain, about what this technology can really do and how it can positively change their lives. But we have to do a better job, I think, as an industry in doing that education and spending the time on the ground and showing people how to have a digital wallet. What does it look like to not just use an NFT as a cool social symbol, but what does that NFT mean if it means that you are um, tokenizing a tree that's really important to a community that is suffering from deforestation. How do we do that? And there are projects on Cello, like Ethic Hub focusing on farmers, Good Dollar focusing on universal basic income. Like those are really powerful and thoughtful ways that really transforms people's lives on the ground and may not be as cool to talk about because it's less speculative. Well, I, think, I think UBI is very cool. Right? So, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> I do too. <laughs> so the idea with the UBI project is they're actually using the chain to distribute the UBI payments. Right, oh, to people around okay. the world. And it's really, I think, saw a real big need both after sort of internationally in the context of what happened in Afghanistan and then what happened in Ukraine yeah. and these monumental shifts within days or even you know, yeah. with the earthquakes in Turkey of how do you get funds to people in a secure and quick way? And I think one of the biggest things that, you know, even I saw in my sort of my former life is how cost expensive it is for everyday people to send funds through the money service businesses that we're mostly familiar with, where there is a very large increase or percentage that you're paying. So if I was to try to send money home to Ukraine, it may cost me, you know, and I'm sending, let's say, for argument's sake, $500, and there's like a 20% increase, then that's a lot of money if I'm a a day laborer. It's very significant. And it's also really significant 
and that, you know, and I saw again, like sort of the impact of people doing that, where if you're sending it to vulnerable populations and they have to go to a brick and mortar location to pick that up, you may be putting them in a more vulnerable position than if it is secure on their phone and nobody necessarily sees that those funds are coming there. And then they know that it really is going to them it's or to the, their families and they can use it as they need. And I think the other thing I should point out is also this foundation also works on a lot of support and grant funding for on and off ramps, which I think is really critical, right? So how do you actually transform your cello, the digital asset to something that you can use in your local community, yeah. right? And for that, you need to have interoperability and you need to have those secure on and off ramps. And that's where finding those partners around the world that are building that infrastructure, right? Yeah. And bridging the gap between web two and web three is so really important because that's also part of how do you get adoption? You need people to be able to use those funds. That's right. Are those banks or are those payment processors? or who? So some of them are payment processors. Okay. Some of them are also in the decentralized finance world where okay. they either partner, at, you know, the business models can differ. They yeah. may partner with a local community bank, maybe yep. a local bank. Some of them are peer to peer. Mm -hmm. So just like you have a peer to peer exchange, this would be a peer to peer secure, a self-hosted wallet. And a lot of that also requires a lot of education, right? So yeah. a lot of what the foundation does is also partner with nonprofits who are doing the work on the ground to actually teach the community and invest in those communities learning and sharing that information with each other. Yeah, this idea of like financial education, financial inclusion, people of the Southern Hemisphere, how do we bring them the bring them up to the yeah. standard? It's such a compelling mission to, yeah. to take on. I'm really curious, so you were at Department of Justice before I taking was. on this role. I was. We know a lot of people at Department of Justice through our work here at Chain yeah. Analysis. I do too, yeah. <laughs> I, I like them very much, yes. Uh, I, I yeah. do as well. Yeah. I, I would categorize, if I could take the average across people that, that we get to interact with at DOJ as being kind of skeptical of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And so I feel like you've taken a, the not obvious path to take on this role. I'd love to hear kind of you know, how you first encountered cryptocurrency and then like what led you into the to the job you have today? Yeah, I think it's probably accurate to say I had a unique transition, but I actually think it was really quite organic. Most of my career as a prosecutor was working on white collar investigations, but very focused on victims, whether victims of human trafficking or child exploitation or victims of crime and focusing on following the money and trying to identify how do you best dismantle criminal organizations and then identify their assets, seize their assets, restrain their assets, and use restitution to make victims whole. Yeah. So sort of two, a two-prong approach. And one of the thing, you know, there were several cases that involved digital currency or exchanges that were how I first touched this space. Yeah. What, and what time frame was that, if you remember? So I think... My first investigations were probably 18 and on. When I was at the Manhattan DA's office, there were some Bitcoin ATM cases that colleagues worked on. And I feel like in the 16, 17, that was like, now looking back seems so pedestrian versus what we see now. But what was interesting about the cases I worked on was again, that, that point about how quickly you can trace assets and how the tools like those and that, you know, at full transparency, you know, used a lot of chain analysis tools <laughs> uh, when I was in government and uh, we use them at Zello now, but it was really eye-opening to see how quickly I could get information in real time or my investigators could get information in real time using analytical tools, but it also forced me to learn, right? And learning about how to use the tools, what is the information that is being gathered, how it's verified. But then at the same time, I also saw the struggles of a lot of the victims I worked with, with access. And it's interesting you talk about the global south, but when I first moved to DC from New York, someone talked to me about food deserts and I didn't understand what that really was. Cause you know, in New York, we have everything from a bodega to like a real supermarket. But as I dug into sort of this world and this space and interact, doing a lot of investigations, there's also a lot of financial deserts in the US. Yeah. And I think we have a privilege of living here that we trust 
that, you know, our money will be in a bank. But there are a lot of communities and victims that I worked with that became survivors that didn't have that easy access, that didn't have that identification to just go to a bank and open an account. And I really thought about what does this technology do? How can digital ID be something that blockchain technology can help with? How do we do compliance better with blockchain technology? Yeah. And I think that's really interesting. And I was driven by the mission. Yeah. I care very deeply about the cases that I did, the cases I left behind. But I think that I have found that the mission at the foundation and what projects are building and the thought leadership around how do we make things better but sometimes by rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work is a lot harder it's yeah. not as you know to use the term sexy it's not always so sexy <laughs> right and i used to do that when i used to train you know investigators on how do you follow the money and yeah. like excel spreadsheets right like when you become a an FBI agent, you're looking to bang down a door. You're not yeah. like, you know, meeting with Jane, the former prosecutor saying like, I'd like to look at some Excel spreadsheets today. No, that no, no, no. That was not top of the list. The of the list. No. They were like, no, I don't, I don't want this <laughs> trial attorney. I want a different prosecutor. So I'm very objective about that. But I think that it was an organic process where yeah. I feel like I found a home where the mission drives a lot of the work. And that has been really important to me throughout my career. Yeah. And I do think that we have to do a better job to innovate, but in a way that we get the technology to the people that need it most, yep. whether it's in the U.S. or abroad. I completely agree. I was sort of stunned maybe a year and a half ago. I was given data that was sort of like 5 million people in the United States are totally unbanked adults, yes. which blew my mind <laughs> because I come from a place of extreme privilege, I think, relative to most people on the planet. And it just wasn't in my awareness that we had that big a problem just in the United States. And then obviously as you go abroad, it's significantly greater. So if we can if we can solve that and improve financial inclusion like that, I'm on board with that. Mission. Yeah. So yeah. You know, obviously it's been a rocky last year for, for the cryptocurrency industry as a whole. I'm curious as you look to the future, what's on the horizon? What's got you excited about coming in the next, in the next 12 months? I'm looking for some good news. And yeah, I think just the conversations are starting to yeah. really get meatier, yeah. right? In terms of how do we do better or how do we talk about the technology versus the speculation? Yeah. And really not just doing the talking, but really doing the work mm -hmm. and the work takes time. And so I'll sort of talk about this a little bit tomorrow, but really finding those partners within the industry and outside of the industry that are committed to whatever the principles that are being built, right? Whether it's to increase diversity, whether it's to get more uh, different types of, of people with different perspectives into the room to help build. I think that's great. I yeah. think it's really important. I think it's interesting how organically projects um, kind of develop all over the world and what they think about and how people are creating, you know, climate dashboards to actually keep accountability, right? Yeah. Or even how courts have started to accept NFTs, right? As a, method of service. If someone had said this to me five years ago, I probably would never believe it, but it's <laughs> happening, right? And I think that's interesting. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of innovation. It's moving faster. Yeah. We're in a very global world. People are talking. They're using their phones. Social media changes things. And I think that that's going to continue. And I think with thoughtful leadership and regulation around it, it will evolve. And I think it will evolve in a mature way. Otherwise, those projects just, they won't be around if yeah. it doesn't, to be honest. Yeah. A lot of people have talked about about this being like a great moment to clean up some of the things that probably you know, shouldn't have been here or weren't for the greater good. But it seems like your organization is, uh, is here for the long run doing some important stuff. We're gonna, we're, we hope so. And I think it's more about the projects and the builders that yeah. are on for doing the hard work. Yeah. We're just here to support them. And I think part of that is finding those projects, right? And having them come to us, but also feel like they can continue building in a safe and secure way. And, and that's really 
I think, important. And one last thing I will yeah. say is that I think there has to be the funding model, the investment piece, not necessarily from the foundation, but just outside in the in the industry also has to expand, right? There have to be more projects that are supported, whether they're female run or, yeah. you know, focused on really increasing who is getting that funding and who is getting that attention yeah. and education and who's part of those sprints. And I think that will be really important as well, because the more you have different voices, the better, hopefully, the dialogue will be. And I think you build better when you have different perspectives kind of pushing to improve what the end result looks like and who it's supposed to benefit. I mean, there's such a gender imbalance in tech generally. And then in a lot of crypto tech rooms, like it, it, it goes even further in the wrong direction. So I think you're doing some work. The Association yeah. for Women yeah. in Crypto. Yeah. Are... So I'm a proud board member for AWEC, Association for Women in Crypto. And I think, you know, the goal really was to not just have another association, but to have something where women from all parts of Web3, blockchain technology, not just lawyers, not just compliance, but marketing, investors, yeah. founders had a safe space. And I remember I was told once by someone to, to take a seat at the table, right? To like own my seat at the table. And I think that that's partially right, but I think it's more than just taking a seat at the table. It's making room for others at the table yeah. once you have that seat. Yeah. And I think that's what Amanda and the association is really trying to do is to not just be mentors, but to be champions for one another and support each other. And I think that is really important because that also helps people feel like they can take that step if they're thinking about starting their own company or building a project or seeking funding from a VC firm. And that's really, it's been really amazing to see how many different women around the world are doing something in this space and how often their experiences are similar and yeah. how we can support that. So it's been an exciting, you know, I, last six months. I've been watching uh, Amanda's LinkedIn post. She's traveled <laughs> around the globe carrying that message. And yes. It's great. She used to work at Chainalysis. We yep. talked about this idea, you know, almost two years ago for wanting to start this association or passion for it and that mission you just described. And then obviously she went off and, and did a pretty yep. important job for, for a year working with the yep. House of Representatives and then to see this thing come to life is just so exciting. Yeah, so. and we're very lucky yeah. it, just to see how many people, I mean, I mean, that has been the tip of the sphere. And yeah. I think being genuine and authentic about who you are and what you're trying to build is also so important because people have to trust that. They have to feel comfortable and secure to be their genuine selves. And the only way to do that is if you really feel you're pulling people up with you. Jane, this is amazing. So thank nice you so to much. For, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. yeah Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. All yeah. Right. Congratulations on, on all of this. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks for listening to a special Live from Links episode of Public Key. This was the fifth and last episode of the Live from Link series. This special five-part series covered everything from cybersecurity to regulations to tokenization and sustainability. And it was brought to you by our good friends at Deloitte, the official sponsor of Live from Links. It seems you can't go to any conference or meetup around the world without a debate of how do we achieve privacy and also satisfy regulatory and compliance requirements. Our team at Chainalysis shares insights on one side of that debate by going in-depth depth on the industry's leading privacy coin, Monero. In the blog, we cover the basics on Monero, its privacy enhancing features, and what the future holds for privacy coins in an area of increased regulatory scrutiny on anonymity enhanced coins. Head down to the show notes and read the entire blog.